the time to join this webinar. Paul, thank you, and thank you, uh, the uh, good folk at Echolight, for inviting me to give this talk, uh, which I'm delighted to do. Uh, uh, as Paul said, I used to be a spinal surgeon. Uh, I, I'm now um, pain management and rehabilitation, and over the last few years, I have been doing a lot of work on uh, bone health, both in the younger age group with sports people, but also in the older age group uh, with fractures. Um, that's been part of my um, practice uh, for many, many years, but it's only since 2018 that I've had the opportunity to then uh, actually take that further with the use of the ECHOS. <coughs> so what I'd like to cover this afternoon in the next 40 minutes or so, uh, what are the options for bone health assessment? Some of which you've already heard from Paul, um, so I'm not going to uh, slavishly repeat what he said, but there are some added, added things to uh, put to that. Then we could talk about what impaired bone health means and what the fracture risks are, because it's not quite as straightforward as you'd be led to believe. Uh, we've got a T-score of minus 2.5, therefore you are at risk of fracturing. Yes, you are, but there are nuances and the latest technology from Echolite has, uh, has cast a lot of light on that and is certainly uh, revolutionizing practice. Moving on then to female athletes, um, the title of course that Paul put up was, was, was actually a little wrong because it's this, the title is uh, sports women and men, because in this it is women who are the more important. Um, and so we're discussing the risk factors for impaired bone health in women. And then a, a particular uh, aspect of my practice is that I am a regional and national referral centre for bone stress injuries. Um, I see a lot of uh, sports people from professionals down to amateurs, uh, and I'll take you through some of the bone health issues associated with bone stress injuries. And at the very end, how can we use REMS as a point of care assessment in managing sports people's bone health? So what are the options for bone health assessment? Essentially, there are four technologies. DEXA, you've heard about. REMS, you've heard about. Quantitative peripheral CT, um, which is uh, a very accurate uh, way of looking at bone mineral density, uh, but like DEXA is a, is a big machine inside a hospital, and then quantitative ultrasound, which Paul alluded to. They all have strengths and weaknesses. DEXA is accurate in measuring bone mineral density. If the machine and the unit has the correct software, they can measure what's called the trabecular bone score, which is effectively equivalent to the fragility score that REMS offers. And that is measuring the quality of bone, the toughness of bone. So fracturing a bone is not just about the bone mineral density, but it's about how well your bone is built. And we'll come on to that uh, in due course. Bone stiffness is measured by quantitative ultrasound, and that is uh, not measured by any other technology currently in use. It's of limited use and it's actually then correlated with bone mineral density, which means that QUS is quite good as a, a very uh, rapid, cheap and cheerful screening tool, uh, but as a diagnostic tool, as a predictor for uh, future events, uh, it doesn't have much to play at the moment. And quantitative peripheral CT, very good for bone mineral density, but it can't do bone toughness currently and obviously not bone stiffness. They are the technologies, uh, two of which are very definitely in hospital radiation, ionizing radiation technologies, two of which are portable uh, in peripheral units using ultrasound. So when we think about the early assessment of bone health and one of the benefits that the Echolite systems have brought to clinicians is the ability to assess people's bone health at a much earlier age, then normally the protocols for DEXA would allow is that it is non-ionizing, as is QUS. It is portable, as is QUS. It has high sensitivity and specificity, which is what you want from a test, which QUS doesn't, but it is reproducible as they all are. So REMS ticks all the boxes. Um, the other technologies, tick important boxes. We must not take away from them. They are the gold standard. They have what's coming for. But REMS is now the, the future of bone health assessment, particularly in early understanding of bone health. And we can 
uh, taking as far down as teenagers and anywhere up from that age um, uh, without any difficulty and without any of the problems of ionizing radiation, accepting that DEXA is a very, very small dose of uh, radiation. And even if you had a number of DEXA scans in your life, they probably wouldn't have much of a negative effect on your overall health. For those of you who have not seen a DEXA scan, this is how it's carried out. This is a hologic discovery unit. Uh, it's a large piece of equipment, as Paul said. It has to be in a special room with what's called a Faraday cage uh, to, to keep it in, um, some sort of lead shielding. And it produces a, a beam of X-ray that then is interpreted by the software. So what we're going to get out of this are the T-score. So what is the T-score? I'll come on to how we interpret this in a second, but T-score is looking at a person's bone density, comparing them to a healthy 30-year-old of the same sex. So you can only use a T-score in people above the age of 30. A Z-score compares your bone density with other people your age, particularly useful for under the age of 30 and over the age of 75. Bone mineral density, that's the amount of effectively calcium you've got in your bone, and that's an aerial measure, so it's grams per centimeter squared. And then if the uh, software is installed, you can get a trabecular bone score, which is a measurement of toughness of the bone. So that's how the actual individual spicules of bone are formed, how they're organized, um, and uh, whether they're tough or not. But this is very important in terms of the DEXA scan, and that is there are things called regions of interest, and you saw in the video the ECHOS regions of interest, and for DEXA, you see these boxes and these lines on these pictures, these are the regions of interest that the DEXA operator has to get right, and if you don't get those right, or if there's something that's causing confounding error, and Paul alluded to the artifacts on the spine. So when you look at the spine, sometimes you have spurs of bone coming from the side of the vertebra, and this can cause uh, a, a region of interest not to be exactly as we think it is. So there is an error rate when placing the, these boxes and regions of interest. And that's really what uh, in real world DEXA means that it's, it's got a, a, an accuracy rate in the low 90% range uh, as opposed to the very high 90% range. When we look at the strengths and weaknesses of DEXA, it is simple. There's no doubt about it. You lie on the table, you get put in the right position, you have a low dose of X-ray, data collection is fast. It is by far the most standardized bone mineral density measurement available. And there are now millions and millions of data points across all the papers in the world that tell us about uh, DEXA. So it's a, it's a very well studied, very well validated form of bone mineral density assessment, and it remains the uh, effective gold standard. Across a platform, it is precise. And what that means is that a manufacturer will make sure that all of their machines produce the same results. However, we know that different manufacturers use uh, the technology in slightly different ways. So you cannot directly compare one manufacturer's result with another manufacturer's result. And there's a, there could be anything up to a 12% difference. And the other problem is that with body composition, if you have people who are uh, of a, uh, have a great deal of fat, uh, so a large body mass index, that can then cause some difficulty. So, so these are the strengths of the body composition assessments. They can do that. Uh, they can make the body, they can make the body composition assessment, but of course it has a negative effect, and that is it sometimes uh, uh, reduces the accuracy. Weaknesses, it's a fixed site. It's very much dependent on the operator to get the person on the scanner right. Um, if you've got a spinal deformity, a scoliosis, if there are screws in the spine, it cannot give you a reliable result. There is some variability once you're putting those regions of interest onto the, uh, the X-ray, um, so that, that can give you some inaccuracies. Uh, as I've alluded to, then across platforms, there is variation. We also know that bone mineral density in its own right does not just predict fracture risk. So, and Paul mentioned that the reproducibility across time is too low. It's only five or six percent uh, between scans in a year. Therefore, effectively, to monitor treatment, you may not be able to monitor them in less than three or four years. Um, so, 
this is this is REMS. So you saw a, a nice video of it, but this is in real life. So you do a hip scan. It's very much like an ultrasound. Anybody who's had an ultrasound will recognize that probe, recognize the jelly. It's always cold. Um, and we do it on the left hip, or if there's a problem, we can then go to the right hip. And in some people, we do both uh, by default. But if you've had a hip replacement or a fracture on one side or the other, then obviously you can't do the scan. And then we do the spine through the abdomen so the patient doesn't have to move, very straightforward for them. And what you can get are the pictures that you saw from Paul's presentation. You have the hip and that blue area is the region of interest and that correlates then to the, to the neck of femur. If you can see my cursor here, this is the area we're looking at. And then on the spine, there are the four vertebrae that are sequentially scanned and that correlates from L1 down to L4. What the machine gets is information that is effectively this frequency graph. graph. And the ROI or region of interest is the bit it's really wanting to look at. It then creates a mathematical model, which is a curve and the algorithm and the software in the machine then compares that curve to all of those results that is in the machine, the 150,000 results, whatever it might be, um, and it comes up with the best fit, and that then gives us the results. So you've seen these uh, uh, reports. Uh, I think they're very attractive. They're certainly more attractive than, than DEXA, um, uh, and that's because the Italians are very good designers. Uh, after all, look at their cars. Um, in these reports, you have a huge amount of information. So the first thing we've got are the demographics at the top. So we've got the, the name blanked out, age, um, and then the um, menopause, how long since the menopause, you know that. But most importantly here, you've got the body mass index. That is crucially important in measuring bone health, and we'll come on to that in due course. You then have the result for the femur. Uh, there, your, your targeted dot there, and then I'll go through what the um, this traffic light system needs in a second. You then have the result for your neck of femur. It gives you the amount of mineralization at the neck of femur, a T-score, a Z-score, and also a diagnosis. This is the World Health Organization classification. So anything from zero to minus one is normal. Anything above zero is normal. Down to minus one is normal. Minus one to minus 2.5 is osteopenia, and worse than minus 2.5 is osteoporosis. So this person has a Z score, a T score, sorry, of minus 2.1 osteopenia, and then in the spine, minus 2.3 osteopenia. On top of that, there is a FRAX calculation. This came from the University of Sheffield, now taken up by the World Health Organization, which is fracture prediction based upon risk factors. And then in the lumbar spine, we have our individual bone mineral density values, as you do for the rest of the hip. The new software gives the fragility score. So this is the uh, uh, fragility score for this, this person. And what they have is osteopenia, but the fragility is actually still in the green zone. So they've got quite tough bone, which is good. And from that, you then get a prediction algorithm that tells you exactly what your risk of fracturing the next five years is. And for this person in the hip, it's between 10 and 20 percent. And that now is standard software with all the new uh, Echolytes, as long as you buy that, buy that bit of it. So what are the strengths and weaknesses of REMS? Well, it's mobile. So I've been all over the place with, with my kid. It goes to the back of my car. I can take uh, effects in my whole clinic. Uh, very easy, load up 20 minutes, unload, set up, and then we do uh, point of care testing. It's simple, it's fast, and there is no radiation. Ultrasound is completely uh, safe. It is operator independent. As long as you can shine the probe at the region of interest, it doesn't matter then what you do to the rest of it, because after that, the machine takes over. So if you can't get the acquisition, you get no result. If you've got the acquisition, then you have a result and it's independent of you. It doesn't matter if there's a spinal deformity or previous spinal surgery. Uh, in most cases, I've got used to doing scans on people with scoliosis that then has to go around the corner a bit, which is fine. Anybody who's done more than a few hundred of the scans gets used to that as well. Results, I say immediate, well, mostly it's within 30 seconds to a minute uh, and you get the result on the screen. I then uh, then uh, store, store it for sending for up by email 
and also print it off and give it to the patient as a uh, as a report immediately. We know there is precision across platform, just the same as DEXA, and the intra-observer variation is really very low. We measured it in the first 500 scans we did, um, and my inter um, observer variation was 1%, and my other colleagues was up to 2.9%. So we know, therefore, that if you then have a good intra-observer variation and inter-observer variation, that is that if it's another colleague of mine doing it, then their variation is very low. We can monitor even with different people, so that doesn't then change the uh, accuracy of it. And we also know that fragility score is actually good at predicting fracture risk from the studies that Paul showed you. At the moment, the only weakness effectively is that there is limited independent verification of studies compared to DEXA, but as the days and years go by, then those studies will emerge. So when you look at the actual uh, accuracy of it, and you saw that the FDA said it was equivalent, and this shows that it's exactly that. So it doesn't matter uh, which you look at, whether it's the sensitivity, specificity, T-score correlation, femur and spine, they, they're all very similar. And these thresholds are above what the Royal Osteoporosis Society requires for establishing the diagnosis of osteoporosis using ultrasound-based technology. The ROS uh, in the um, recent uh, publication, Osteoporosis News, which was the autumn 2020 edition, uh, gave a, a grudgy acceptance to REMS, uh, which is, uh, was very nice to read. And they said, yes, it's a very good technology, but more data is needed. And that's absolutely true. And we all recognize that. And Echolite is working very hard globally to achieve that. So thinking now about bone health and its impairment and how it relates to fracture risk, when you see these reports, it's quite easy to be lost and think, well, what does it all mean? So let me take you through them. On the left hand, you have the y-axis, which tells you your density of bone, your bone mineral density in grams per centimeter squared. On the x-axis is the age, the standard measurement is between the age of 20 and 85. Um, and on the right side, you then got what the equivalent T-scores are. So the vertical line is our nominal 30-year-old. And this is a 30-year-old who's been measured using what's called the NHANES 3 database, which is an American database looking at hundreds of thousands of people and all of their physical and uh, biological parameters. So they know that the average 30 year old is going to have a bone mineral density of around about 0 0.85, 0 0.87 um, grams per centimeter squared, something like that. That's, that's where that is. So if we then say, well, what then is the definition of normal? If that is zero, that's our ground zero, what's minus one? Here's our T-score, minus one. It's one standard deviation away from the mean. And this is assuming that the population is a normal population, therefore it's a bell curve. So one standard deviation below the mean uh, then means that you've got anybody above that is in the green zone, normal. And of course that therefore goes across as a horizontal line because it's fixed, because that's, that's what it is, this definition. Between one standard deviation and 2.5 standard deviations is osteopenia, which is this pre-osteoporotic um, state. And then below 2.5 standard deviations is osteoporosis. And these are the World Health Organization diagnoses. But what confuses people often are the three black lines. What do they mean? And actually, in many respects, they're more important because this is the, the modal value for bone density according to age. So the modal value is the most popular value. So it's a little bit different from the mean, but in a normal population with large numbers of people, it's similar. So if we then look at this lady's results, and she's 54, we can see that her, Z, her score lies a little below the modal value, which means she'll have a negative Z score. That's what that's comparing to. So that's comparing to your age, not comparing back to, to here, which is your T score. And then as time goes by, as you see, then you get a gradual reduction in your bone density with aging, which is normal. The top line and the bottom line, they represent the two standard deviations away from the modal value. And that's encompassing, therefore, 95% of the population. So I saw the other day, and one of these pictures you'll see uh, coming up, a lady who was 60, a uh, runner, and very slim, uh, below normal weight. And I said to her, look, I'm, you know, 
without even measuring your bone density, you will be osteoporotic. And, and sure enough, she was, and I'll show you her pictures. You can look at people and you can see from their BMI often just about where they're going to be in this spread. And you know that 95% of the population have to be between that line and that line. Now, our big rugby players or cricketers, fast bowlers, they're up here somewhere. So they're outliers because they put lots of pressure through. Someone who's been on steroids or has been lying in bed for several years because they've had such a terrible illness will be down here, as would an astronaut because they've lost bone density. But 95% of the population will lie for their age somewhere between those two lines. And so it's quite normal when you are 60 and female to have a diagnosis of osteoporosis because by definition, a group of women will have to have that. And when we look at that then, this is the risk of fracturing. There's these, these are fragility fractures. A fragility fracture is a fall from no height. You fall over and you land on your wrist and you break it. If you, if you anybody on the call today, on the webinar today, if they're normal, fit, healthy, they should be able to fall over, land on the wrist and not break it. But if they have reduced bone, toughness and bone density that they may do. Now, in our young age group, our 35 year old women, only 1% of women will be suffering a fragility fracture of a year. Take that to 55, the influence of menopause kicks in and then you've got seven in a hundred. But over the age of 75, it massively increases. And of course, now you've got one in four women, 75 years and older is going to get a fragility fracture. So. It's very important when you're looking at age and all the other parameters to try to predict exactly what is going to happen to that woman as she, as she ages. This graph shows you what the fracture rate is according to your bone mineral density. So if you've got a bone mineral density better than one, then your fracture rate is very low. If you've got a bone mineral density in the osteopenia range here, it's gradually rising. And as you would expect, a fracture rate for the quite severely osteoporotic people is quite high. So that's, that's right up there, which is fine. And you say, OK, that's, that's understandable. The, the lower bone mineral density you have, the more you're likely to fracture. But this is the actual number of women who fracture at these particular bone mineral density levels, these T-scores. These and what you see it's the highest number of women fracturing actually have osteopenia. And you think, hang on a second, why isn't it this group of people with severe osteoporosis who have the largest numbers? Well, there are two reasons. One of which is that these are tend to be elderly women who are less mobile, therefore they may not actually be mobile enough to, to fall into fracture. So although the, the rate is higher, the numbers are actually smaller. And the other reason is this. And that is toughness. And this is the conundrum that we've been struggling with for years with DEXA. And that is how do we translate bone mineral density into the fracture risk and how do we measure toughness? And this was what the trabecular bone score originally tried to do and what the fragility score has now done. On the left hand side, you see a metal pylon, a radio mast, which is relatively lightweight. It's extremely strongly built, made of tough material, and that will stand up to a hurricane without any difficulty at all. On the right, you see a pile of bricks without any cement. That's massive, but there's no structural integrity. And a bit like the, the, the story in Hans Christian Andersen of the, the wolf blowing the, the pig's house down, if the wolf blew that or blew on that, that would blow down, but the wolf could blow as hard as it liked on the, on the pylon and it wouldn't. So what we've got, therefore, is effectively now an understanding of not only what the, the mass of bone is, i.e. bone mineral density, but also its build quality, its toughness. And from Echolite, we now have the fragility score, which is really important to understanding that. So let's move on to female athletes, because this is about sports medicine. What are those risk factors? This is a really important graph um, because it shows the average change in bone mineral density with time and with age. So when you are born, you have no calcium in your bones, your cartilage effectively. As you grow older, calcium increases until you get to around 30 to 35, which is what's called peak bone mass. After that, you do not 
increase your bone density unless something happens to specifically change it. Um, and that's probably the uh, 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 subject of another talk and how you, how you actually can, can change things when you get into the menopausal and postmenopausal area. However, if you then recognize that peak bone mass for a woman occurs about here, the question then is, well, what's gonna happen after that? Is it the same as men? Well, clearly not, because the male peak bone mass generally is higher because men are more massive than women, therefore they put more pressure through their bones and they have higher BMD. And then when the, you get to this point here, after the age of about 50, that's when the effect of menopause is kicking in. Of course, then estrogen is lost and estrogen is absolutely vital in uh, maintaining bone health. So postmenopausal bone loss, of course, is a really important aspect of women's bone health. Now, when we're talking about an athlete, there are factors that are under her control and there are factors that won't be under her control. So what can she do to make sure that she has good bone health? Nutrition. She's got to have enough calcium in the diet. Uh, so dairy, big issue. Vitamin D, particularly in these northern latitudes where we don't get enough sunshine. Um, and uh, just on the you know, matter of vitamin D, if your vitamin D is low, it turns out that it might actually then have a, a negative effect on your ability to resist viral infections, specifically COVID. Calorific intake is absolutely vital, and we'll come on to that too, with the female triad, and then the regularity of periods, because if you don't have regular periods, you haven't got then reliable estrogen in the system that's driving healthy bone to be formed. When she exercises, the most important component is that there's a varied load and a varied frequency. Repeated load, repeated frequency only gets the bone so far. It'll, it'll adapt to that load and that frequency. It will not get better than that. So people who play a single sport or do something that's repetitive over and over and over again without varying it will not necessarily have really good bone health. That is an issue. And of course, the avoidance of harm, cigarettes, excess alcohol and harmful drugs. So those are factors under her control. But what she can't change is her hormonal status when she had her menarche, when she first started having periods or when she has the menopause. And that's under, under different control. What her genetics are, is there a family history of porosis? Um, ethnicity. So, for instance, uh, Caucasian and Asian people have a lower bone mineral density than Afro-Caribbean people. So if you are an Afro-Caribbean athlete, your bone density is going to be better than your white component, your equivalent. So you therefore have to take that into control. And small frame. Um, small frame is very important. That comes into body mass index. Equally, medical conditions that might then affect bone density, particularly those requiring steroids, not inhaled steroids, but uh, um, systemic steroids and other um, chronic uh, diseases have effects on bone health that are not under her direct control. Now, when we look at this and we actually compare the specific risk for younger women versus old, older women, down the left hand side are all the risk factors for reduced bone health in women. On the right, you can see that in younger women, they can't change being female, that's a risk factor. If one of their parents had a hip fracture, they can't change that. If they're an, a, an elite athlete, but uh, going into the, uh, uh, the sort of middle ages, uh, if they have an early menopause, they can't change that. They can't change a malabsorption of food type uh, problem like Seagate disease or Crohn's. You can't necessarily change body weight or a small stature. I mean, if you're born short, you're not going to grow at all, uh, but you can do something about weight maybe. Um, and, and perhaps actually sort of no, no periods uh, for six months, that's, that's under uh, possibly uh, her control, possibly not. But these are factors that are specific for the, the younger um, woman and therefore the athlete, whereas all the other ones tend to be associated either with non-athletes or with women in the uh, middle and older years. So when we look at one group of women athletes, and ballet dancers particularly, and I went to the Royal Ballet a uh, year and a half ago and had a, a long chat with them down there about their, um, their ballerinas um, and their, their male ballet dancers. And we talked a lot about what the 
influences are on bone health. And, and Erica Mayle did a lovely study um, looking exactly at this. And you can see, I don't need to go through all of these, but the influences of the, excuse me, <coughs> what actually has gone on the previous slide about the calorific insufficiency, vitamin D levels, et cetera, hormonal status, all of these are very important. They're the bits that she might or might not be able to change. But what's really interesting from the sports medicine point of view is the actual technique. So do they have normal bony alignment? Are the training surfaces right? You know, what are their biomechanics doing? What's their intensity? What I thought was really interesting was the training load because in dancers training more than five hours a day, they increase their stress fracture risk irrespective. And that's it. So about other bits. So, so overdo it and you will increase your risk and get below that you won't and i'll show you what that is due to it's called the mechanostat and i'll show you that in a second so when we go back to our peak bone mass and if we put our line through peak bone mass this woman <coughs> aged 30 35 if we then superimpose on that our traffic light system what we can see is that in this top portion these women have normal bone so they reach normal bone by the time they are late teens early 20s they stay in the normal region up to 55 60 and then they enter the osteopenic range and by the time they're 85 they're only just at the bottom of the range of osteopenia only maybe just getting into osteoporosis so from their point of view they are fine through their lives all other things being equal but if you get a woman who at the age of 20 only gets into the osteopenic range here for whatever reason, and she's going to follow that same curve, what you can see is that they might, if they're lucky, just about get into the normal range by the time they're 30. So peak bone mass is going to be suboptimal, but it falls off and very quickly they enter the osteoporotic range then early on in their lives, so around that time of menopause. And of course, if you've got a person who never gets into even osteopenia, then they dive into menopause early. So we can look at that. Uh, there's another, another slide that shows that in a second. But what this shows you is that the key age range here is middle teens to 30. If we can get it right in the middle teens to 30, then we can optimize women's bone health. And that has a massive effect on the back end of their lives. Now, Looking at specific issues with training and athletics, the female triad, which I'm sure anybody who's been involved in sports medicine is well aware of, is that what you're really doing is you're reducing the amount of energy you've got in your system to keep your system healthy. So normally, if you've got optimal energy available, you'll have eumenorrhea, i.e. normal periods, and optimal bone health. That's what we're aiming for. But if you overtrain, you're using up your energy and there's a reduced energy availability. And many of you may have heard of the syndrome RED hyphen S, red S, that is reduced energy, relative energy deficiency of sport. And what's happening here is that the reduced energy means that you don't then have available energy to do all the normal things, the hormonal things. In addition, this is often associated with eating disorders. Um, and there's a another discussion about why that is and this whole area is really interesting but quite involved in those women subclinical menstrual disorders happen at which point you then get into the stage where they don't have periods they then get low body mass index that leads to low bone mineral density they fail to reach peak bone mass and they end up with osteoporosis so what if she doesn't reach peak bone mass? So the, the top curve is, is men. This curve is the normal for women according to the NHANES 3 database. There's our peak bone mass set to 30 now. So this is a, an athlete who's gone through her teenage years and she's been building bone, building bone, building bone, doesn't quite reach peak bone mass in the normal range. So she's going to have a Z score, T score of around about minus 0.5 she's going to then reduce plateaus for about 10 years and then the, the bone mineral density reduces around the age of 50 she become osteoporotic and by the time she's into her 70s and 80s severely osteoporotic 
What about our ballerina? What about the people who are in their teens and have eating disorders who starve themselves because of their sport? They never ever get to anything like normal peak bone mass. They're only just above the level of osteoporosis here at the time of maximum bone formation. And you know, by the time of 40, they're back into the osteoporosis range and then they are severely osteoporotic going into their 50s, 60s, 70s. So what happened here in their teens and early 20s has a dramatic effect from the age of 40 onwards in that group of people. This is a, a real life case, a lady I scanned on Monday who's 60 years old and she's a runner. She's run all of her life. So she's a long distance runner. Look at her body mass index, 16.23. She's quite severely underweight. Um, she's not anorexic. She's never had an eating disorder, but she is in that category of the women in the female triad that she would have been when she was very young. So when we look at her score now, at the age of 60, she's, she's, she's severely osteoporotic. Her T-score is minus 4.2. If you translate that score back up the hill and you parallel that bottom curve, when she was 20, she was osteoporotic. When she was 30, she was osteoporotic. She's never been anything apart from osteoporotic, both in her femur and her spine. She's never had a fracture. Why? Because of this. Because this is her fragility score. Even now at 60, her fragility score is well within the green zone for the femur and in the green zone for the spine. So, although she has got very low bone mineral density, she's got tough bones, and those tough bones resist fractures. Now, that then explains some of the reason for osteopenic women to have more fractures than osteoporotic. Because if you have a woman who's got osteopenia, because of the correlation with <coughs> body mass index, they're likely to have a higher uh, bone mineral density with a higher BMI. But they may not be as active, so they may not have that higher uh, bone uh, toughness. And this goes towards that, that argument with the, the, the steel uh, pylon versus the pile of bricks. So heavier person, but the bones aren't necessarily tough. So we know that body mass index is highly correlated with uh, bone mineral density. We know that body mass index is correlated with peak bone mass and therefore bone health in later life. If therefore we can identify women who are at risk in their early years because they have a low BMI, we can maybe do something about that. Now, it turns out that if you could increase peak bone mass for the whole population of women by 10% and eliminate most of the big dip that occurs with menopause, we may be able to actually reduce osteoporosis in the future almost completely. So this is the correlation between patients I've scanned and uh, the, the, the dots represent multiple scans. This is not just a few scans, but what it represents in, in young, young women is the relationship between body mass index and the uh, bone mineral density, the spinal Z score. And uh, R is the Spearman rank correlation coefficient, and then 0.6 is a good correlation, and you see that there's actually a pretty good correlation there. So we know that the lower their body mass index, the more likely they are to have a low Z score, but that's not the totality, because they may well be an athlete who's doing a huge amount of work, putting pressure through their bones, and their bones may be tough, therefore their fragility score is low. How can we look at this and say to women in the teens, 20s, 30s now, if you do something now, you might change it in the future. Well, if we use the current definition of osteoporosis to prevent 95% of the population having osteoporosis by the age of 85, i.e. if the natural history doesn't change, what we've got to do is we've got to shift those three black lines up to where these blue lines are. So that's a massive shift. We've got to get the people who are down here right up to there. So there's got to be a 25% improvement in bone mineral density from the age of 20 onwards. I don't think that's achievable. If we can change though the, 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 the natural history, and if we can increase by 10%, which isn't too far away from what being possible, the uh, bone mineral density at the early ages, 
and by use of clever medication or manipulation of hormones, get rid of the hormonal dip at the menopause, then what you see is we lift 95% of people out of osteoporosis at the age of 85. So I think there are some interesting conclusions from this. One is that we need to educate younger people regarding bone health. Um, and I'm absolutely useless on social media. Um, I can just about manage WhatsApp to communicate. I don't use Facebook, but all people around me are brilliant at it. And that's how I think that this generation that needs to be educated will be educated, broadcast on social media. Dietary advice is so important, particularly where there's so much around on the internet regarding diet and that there's rubbish about that. And a lot of uh, problems now with anxiety and eating disorders, they need to be addressed in a very sympathetic way. We need to get people out more sunshine exposure. Uh, we've all got away from being outside because of the risk of melanoma. We've got to get around that. And then activity. Um, there's as much wrong with being obese and sitting on a couch and just using a device uh, as there is actually being underweight. So we have to address that. And the reduction of variety of sport, that, that, that single training doesn't get you very far in terms of bone health, it lacks robustness, lacks resilience. And we need to, uh, to change that and get back to doing lots of different sports and then avoid overtraining. OK, so that's women in sport. Essentially, I think bone health uh, impairment in young women is preventable, um, but they do need to understand bone health. They need, therefore, access to risk-free assessments. That's where ECHOS is really, really important. They need lifelong impact exercise and dietary education and dietary advice, um, and then later on in life, um, early uh, treatment for menopause so they don't have that big tip. Let's go on to bone stress injuries in men in the last seven to 10 minutes of the talk. So over the last two years, since I've been using the EchoS, uh, I've managed to acquire 49 sportsmen who have had specific scans for their uh, spines. Um, so I don't generally do the, the hip and sportsman, I do the spine uh, because that's where we see the bone stress injuries and that's the clinical um, uh, interest of mine. And what we find is that most of the cricketers refer to me, many of them, uh, well, almost a third of them have had uh, come with uh, bone stress injuries. Got some rugby players, athletics, and a few um, dotted around the other sports. Most are professional, um, and these are the, the bone stress injuries. So, so not quite two-fifths, 40% of the group have bone stress injuries. And trying to understand why that is is, is quite important. So when we're looking at uh, a lot of these sports people, again, it goes back to what I was talking about with the women, and that is that the, the body mass index is really important because there is quite a good correlation. So we saw that the body mass index correlation with the young women was 0.6. In men, it's 0.54. For all of the sports that uh, I've looked at, and then for cricket, it's 0.51. That's still a pretty good correlation. So what we're saying, therefore, is that part of the issue is going to be how heavy you are. If you're underweight, you're not able to put the pressure through your bones to drive up your body mass, your bone mineral density, and to reach peak bone mass. But on top of that, we've got intensity of activity, and this is really the surrogates of it. So when we look at the sports on the left-hand side, what you can see is the cricketers, they come out with the, the highest level of bone mineral density overall. This is a rugby player with a Z score of plus 4.5. And the reason for that is he's six foot 10. He's a lock. He gets thrown up two and a half, three meters into the air about 90 times a week by his other, other um, scrum players and comes down and lands hard on his feet when he's doing jumping practice, as a result of which he's putting massive loads through his spine. And hence he's got this really, really high bone density. Down here, the cyclist is, 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 is the other end of the scale. Um, as you will know, good cyclists are, are you know, generally sort of uh, fairly slim people, uh, plenty of muscle, but not very much uh, else. Um, and of course, cycling is not a weight bearing sport. So therefore the, the bone mineral density is low. But the cricketers are mostly bowlers, fast bowlers, putting a lot of pressure through the spine. And, and some of those have very, very high bone mineral densities as well. So. So that's the, the, the Z score uh, correlation related to sport. When we relate it to status, you can see that the professionals have generally a higher level of bone health, uh, bone mineral density 
uh, than, than, than the amateurs down here. Looking at the groups in terms of just numbers, by and large, those who've had a bone stress injury, they're younger, therefore they haven't reached skeletal maturity. 66% haven't reached skeletal maturity as opposed to 45% without a stress injury. The mean body mass index, again, correlated, so it's lower in the bone stress injury group. The spinal Z scores lower, as you would expect, uh, and there's the variation in the, the number of sports. Um, but what you can see here is that the, the, the amateurs um, tend to have a greater rate of, pro, uh, of stress, uh, bone stress injury than the professionals, possibly because the training regimes are, are a little different. This is the mechanostat. This explains why you get a bone stress injury. So let me explain. Along the y-axis, you have your bone volume change. So it either increases or it decreases. X-axis is the amount of loading you're putting through. So trivial activity, uh, let's um, imagine that's an astronaut in space and uh, zero gravity. They will have no pressure going through their bones and therefore their bone volume will decrease. They have a reduction in bone mineral density. Normal activity, such as what we're doing right now, sitting, listening to a webinar or going out and uh, you know, doing a bit of uh, cycling or gym, uh, normal activity, you're going to be uh, either pretty neutral or slight increase in bone volume. Overload, i.e. you've taken up a new sport um, and you suddenly decided you want to go out and do a bit of boxing or something that could put uh, a different form of loading through your bones with a different frequency, you will build bone. But do that too much and then you overstress the bone and you get into this pathological range where bone fractures. So the Loughborough group uh, with uh, Pete Alway, Nick Pierce, and uh, Catherine Britt Wavell published this paper in 2018. And what they looked at was a series of cricketers who uh, had bone stress injuries and they were measuring their bone mineral density using DEXA repeatedly before the injury, at the time of the injury, after they've been shut down to protect them from the bone stress injury, and then follow them up as they recovered. And what you see is this U-shaped curve of recovery. Now, we would not like not to be putting these athletes through a DEXA scan every two to four weeks. I mean, they will see this level of change because it's massive in these, these athletes, particularly when you're starting with a, an average T-score up here about 2.8. But what we'd love to have is by the side of the, the pitch, uh, the available every day or in the physio room, uh, an Echo S machine, so they can actually then measure every week what the bone mineral density is doing. Uh, so we get a Z score, get a, a, um, an understanding of what's happening here, and that will guide rehabilitation and getting back to sport without any of the risks and without having to travel. So there's localism. So effectively, what we've got is we've got a very acceptable measure of bone health um, that uh, comes in a, in, a, in a really viable form. No radiation, we can screen high-risk players, pre-maturity uh, in all of these, these high-risk sports, uh, totally risk-free. The, the whole thing's local. I've been a real fan of localism uh, all of my, my career. Um, and to take the test to the player is really, I think, a very positive uh, aspect of this and this is the only way that we can actually get young people involved in being interested in their bone health. So monitoring bone mineral density in times when you have an athlete who's been shut down and we know that for professional athletes up to 20% of their professional life may be actually uh, spent recovering either in injury or recovering from injury. We can track that mechanostat. We can understand how much loading we can put through their skeletons at certain times safely. And that means that we can get them back to playing sport in the most efficient way. If we are able to carry out regular bone health assessments, so that's a REM scan, fragility score, vitamin D assessments throughout their sporting career, maybe that actually is something that we should be aiming at as part of the player's welfare and offering it to them to prevent injury. And prevention, we know, is much better than cure.